Uh, thanks everyone for staying to the end of the session. I know it's been a long day. I thought in retrospect I should have put up like a video of Usain Bolt <laughs> yeah, winning the 100 meter final or something. But um, alas, I didn't. So if you need to stand up and stretch or something you know, in order to get the mental juices flowing again, that's fine. Um, just don't leave the room. <laughs> so my talk today, uh, as the title says, is about um, place deposits um, interpreted as a building material, uh, so part of the fabric of constructing a building uh, in early medieval Europe. Deliberate burials of animals, vessels, and other artifacts um, consisting of material that appears to have been specially selected, exceptionally treated, and carefully positioned are persistent, if rare, discoveries in and around buildings throughout early medieval Europe. Um, and these exhibit long-term regional patterns in terms of composition and context. Um, ones that are associated with buildings are sometimes called foundation deposits, and such discoveries have traditionally been interpreted intuitively as blessings upon a new home, charms to ward off evil, or offerings to supernatural power. Recent research has preferred to view these deliberately placed deposits as traces of household practices intended to achieve practical domestic results. Notably, Johanna Bruck um, has argued that the tendency to regard placed deposition and other ritual or ritualized practices as different from functional practices is inherently problematic, as the people carrying out these practices would not have perceived that distinction. Instead, people performing ritualized actions, like any other actions, do so in order to achieve a desired effect. And in so doing, their behavior is rational from the perspective of their own worldview. She writes, it therefore seems likely that ritual actions are perfectly logical, given a particular understanding of how the world works. They appear irrational only to those who cannot follow the historically specific logic which produced them. Subsequent research on place deposits associated with buildings has been informed, at least in part, by Brook's approach. Uh, scholars such as Brook, Foka Gerritsen, Leah Webley, and I have explored how place deposits could have been used to reinforce or redefine the identities of households, family units, communities. Um, they could have been used to negotiate a household social status or to forge communal memory. Now, these sorts of interpretations focus on the social effects of what place deposits were intended to achieve. This paper, on the other hand, wishes to consider the practical effect that they were intended to have on the context in which they were made, namely their role in the architecture and functionality of the buildings themselves. It proposes that place deposits can be understood partly as a kind of building material widely used throughout early medieval, medieval Europe. And specifically, I'll be considering place deposits made in the wall foundations or roof supporting posts of buildings and items placed under floors or under hearths. And I'll be drawing specific examples from southern Scandinavia, Germany, the Netherlands, and England. Um, I realize my abstract also promised Ireland and Iceland, <laughs> but I had to cut those out for time. But I do have the slides, so if you have, want to know what I was going to say about those places, I'm happy to do so during questions. I'm going to argue that these deposits should be viewed not as accessories to a self-sufficient completed structure, but as integral components of the building's architecture, without which its ability to function as a building would be seriously, even fatally compromised. So I'll begin by discussing place deposits in the foundations of buildings. And on the left-hand side, you have um, the Iron Age, late Iron Age settlement at Surbital on the island of Irland off the, southern, off the coast of southern Sweden. Um, in the picture, um, which you, you probably can't make it out at all, but there are sheep bones um, inserted into the stone packing of a roof-bearing post in the first phase of the house. 
They're mostly leg bones, and they were apparently deposited still bearing the meat on them. And similar deposits have been found in two other roof-bearing postals of that same structure. And then another example um, on the bottom left, on the bottom right, um, comes from England, where a horse skull and associated bones, probably from the same animal, were found in an internal doorway in a seventh century timber hall at Brandon in Suffolk. And that's the location of the, of the horse bones. This building was interpreted as a Christian church and the horse remains lay in uh, gray sand fill at the bottom of the post pit, and they appear to, be, appear to have been present while the building was in use. Unfortunately, many of the horse bones were, not, were excavated before the nature of this deposit was recognized, so we don't know whether any of them were articulated. Um, they have been interpreted by the excavator as a foundation deposit associated with superstition or magic, um, Oh, and in this structure, the doors appear to have been prefabricated and then set into these large post pits. So the doors themselves may have been structurally central to the architecture of the buildings, of the building. These foundation deposits might indeed be associated with superstition or magic, but to what end? So as traditionally suggested for such deposits, they could have been offerings to a deity or they could have had a social effect, as suggested by more recent scholars of place deposits. But these interpretations could equally apply to such deposits placed anywhere in or around the building. I would argue from their placement in the foundations that they were meant to have an effect on the structure itself, for example, on its structural integrity. So stone packing used to secure a roof-bearing post uh, the legs of mutton incorporated into the packing may have been intended to strengthen it, like steel rods are used to reinforce concrete. Um, in the setting of a central door frame of a timber hall, um, which is perhaps a central component of that structure's architecture, the horse skull and bones could have provided foundational support or reinforcement for the entire structure. So making the building itself more durable at a time in when we have the first evidence for longer-lived, more permanent structures in Anglo-Saxon England. <clears throat> and there are many um, comparisons for this sort of activity outside of the early medieval period uh, for deposits built into the fabric of houses. Um, on the upper left, um, in this building from Eisinga in Groningen, um, from the fourth century BC, skulls and articulated remains of um, horse, cow, and sheep were placed next to um, the wattle wall of the structure um, in the um, turf uh, cladding that went up the outside uh, part of the wall. Don't mind here. It's all right. um, and then the bottom right, um, 14th century building at Trig Lane in London, sheep jaw, sheep jaw bones were placed um, into the timber foundations on, on either side of that timber. So when place deposits are actually put, incorporated into the fabric of the building like that, it's easy to imagine them acting as a building material. And such an interpretation does not preclude the idea, for example, that they were offerings to a deity. Um, in other words, we can speculate on the rationale for why the deposit was thought to have worked but it seems probable that its purpose related to the building's structural integrity. In other cases, place deposits have been inserted into the foundations at a later stage after construction. So on the top left, um, you can see a plan from the late 6th century um, royal site of Yevering in Northumberland, where a pit uh, was dug into the foundations along the inner wall of the hall. Um, that's the part labeled bone stack uh, because it was filled with a stack of cattle skulls that actually rose up above the surface of the ground and was sort of leaning against the wall of the structure. It's thought that these um, cattle skulls were the remains from ritual feasting. Um, at Guma on uh, Funan, another site with ritual associations, a horde of bracteates and a spiral ring was found in one roof-bearing post of 
um, of one of the smaller buildings there. And that could have been inserted while the building was still standing. Um, and then there's a similar deposit at Guma in another roof-bearing coastal of gold rings and a silver face. So if place deposits set into the foundations of buildings at the time of their construction were intended to strengthen the buildings, then a horde of cattle skulls or a horde of bracteates placed while the buildings were still standing could have been intended to reinforce or to repair the structures, just as old posts um, can be replaced with newer, stronger timbers. <laughs> um, you'll also find place deposits under floors or um, under hearths. So while excavating a building at Chondrofed uh, in on the Isle of Man, this is the small building here outlined in blue. Um, the excavators discovered a small stone setting in the corner of the building um, underneath uh, which was the jawbone of a pig. This was interpreted as, quote, some sort of good luck charm laid there by the builders. And I don't have a picture of, of this particular one, but in the eastern end of a long house at Hulislev in West Jutland was discovered a pit containing five vessels, three large pots, a smaller pot and a cup, all of them complete and upside down and underneath one of the larger pots was an iron object, possibly a hook. These were also interpreted as an offering uh, to bring health and good fortune to the inhabitants and perhaps also as a way of demonstrating their wealth or social status. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is just too, I mean, I specifically arranged yeah. for this to happen in my talk. It's ritual. <clears throat> um, Okay, up here on the top right, you can see the plan of a small structure at Grubin House at the Anglo-Saxon site of Harston in Essex, where a pit was cut through the floor, um, a lapwing skull was placed in it, it was backfilled and sealed with a chalk capping. So, building offerings such as these have often been interpreted as blessings for the house or for its inhabitants, and perhaps they were that but their intended benefits to the house may have been practical and tangible, not just abstract. So animal skulls, uh, ceramic vessels, and artifacts might have been placed in or under the floors of buildings in order to strengthen or stabilize its foundations, or to keep away cold or rising groundwater in the winter. Um, place deposits associated with hearths could have been intended to improve the nutrition, the abundance, the hygiene or even the taste of food. Um, obviously, these are, are speculations of what the, what the exact purpose was, but it seems likely that this purpose was tangible and concrete. So we should follow Brooks' advice and not just recognize these deposits as the remains of ritual practices, but consider what they were meant to do. Recent scholarship has suggested that, that, that the practices may have been used to reinforce social identity, to negotiate status, or to forge memory. And that may be the case, but their association with buildings also cannot be ignored. It seems clear um, that their function related to the building, like any other building material. And beyond that, we can speculate as to whether they were apotropaic, whether they were blessings or curses. A late antique text by um, Sextus Placidus recommends incorporating pieces of a badger's liver into the foundations of the house in order to protect it from fire and pestilence. The badger's liver is as much a building technique as using asbestos or fiberglass insulation is in modern times. Sorry? Two minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, and similarly, similarly, there's no reason why this interpretation should be at odds with other social effects that might be going on, like negotiating status or forging memory. So-called acoustic pots or vases provide a really good historical parallel to the use of place deposits in buildings. These pots were inserted into the walls of churches in the late Middle Ages, especially in France, in order to improve the acoustics of the church. Sound engineers of today are divided as to whether these would have had a noticeable effect. 
But we can imagine that the people who put them into the walls of the churches thought that they would improve the volume or the acoustics or the resonance for some physical reason. And that's something that we can relate to because it resonates with our own modern, Western, empirical, scientific worldview. <laughs> um, another parallel from almost within living memory is provided by the installation of horse skulls under the floors, um, which, as you can read from the quotes, I'm not going to read them out, were, was also done for acoustic purposes, made the fiddle go better if there were horse skulls under the floor of a pub. <laughs> So compared to the acoustic pots in the walls of the church, it's a little bit more difficult to imagine a scientific justification for the belief that screwing horses' heads to the underside of a floor would improve the acoustics of a room. But that's, of course, exactly the point that Brooke was making in her paper. Just because we can't understand the rationales for performing these practices does not mean that they were not done for practical reasons. And the same can be said for place deposits incorporated into the fabric of medieval buildings. Um, in the medieval worldview, powers that we would now deem superstitious or supernatural were thought to be just as physical as sound waves seem to us today. So it's completely plausible that within that worldview, such place deposits were viewed not just as blessings or charms, but as building materials for constructing safe, healthy, and lasting houses. Thank you. <laughs>